All right, so the main answer is D. Let's think about that one. Uh, derivative of sine of AT with respect to T is the derivative of the inside times the derivative of the sine. So it's, uh, what's the derivative of sine? That would be cosine A times cosine of AT. If you take a derivative of, a, of A times cosine of AT, then you get another A, so A squared, and the derivative of the cosine is negative sine, so negative A squared times sine of AT. Negative of some constant times the sine function. Actually, if you take two derivatives of an exponential function, that's C, you get another exponential function. You get A squared times the exponential function. A squared is not going to be a negative number unless A is an imaginary number. So let's not deal with that, although there are situations in, in engineering and in physics where, you, where it's useful to take A to be an imaginary number and, and then an exponential with an imaginary exponent is an oscillating function but we're not going to do here, so we're going to work with sine. Sine is an oscillating function that satisfies exactly the characteristics that you need for the hoop, and that you need for a mass on a spring, and that you need, in fact, for any oscillator that has a potential energy that has a minimum, and, uh, well, if it has a minimum, then it has a restoring force. So any potential energy, actually, that looks like that, that behaves as the distance, as the, the potential energy goes up as the distance from equilibrium squared. Anytime that happens, and it happens very, very often, then uh, oscillations will have a characteristic of the sine function. They'll behave like a sine function. Of course, the sine function looks a lot like a cosine function. So somebody, some people just use the cosine function instead of the sine function. It doesn't really matter. So we're just going to choose one. And that one is the sine. So y of t for the mass on a spring. Y is a function of time, so F I just took as a generic thing because it could be the height. F could be the height that you're measuring, the height of a mass on a spring. It could be the angle of this hoop. F could be theta. The angle of this hoop behaves like a sine function. It could be the angle of this. The angle of this behaves like a sine function as a function of time when it's oscillating back and forth like that. So that's what F is meant to be. It's a generic term for whatever you happen to be measuring that is going back and forth. Whatever the, the quanti physical quantity you are measuring that's oscillating up and down around an equilibrium point. So for instance, F could be theta. Theta as a function of time is some sort of a sine function. I, what I wrote down is a is about as general a sine function as I can get. Sine function that depends on time. Let's do y. OK, so you can see time in there, this uh, small T here is time. So as time goes on, that T right there is getting bigger and bigger. What I've written here, so here's Y. Y is obviously a function of time, so maybe I should just write that. Y obviously depends on time because I see time over there on the right. So Y depends on time somehow. How does it depend on time? Well, there's a sine function <coughs> of time. Um, and then there's these constants that are sitting around. Uh, 2 pi over capital T is what I put in there. Suppose time was 0, then this whole thing would be 0. 
But what if time, this little t here, was equal to capital T? I haven't told you what capital T is, but what if it was? When time is equal to capital T, then this piece right here is 2 pi. If you shift a sine wave by 2 pi, it doesn't change a bit. If time goes on, suppose I call this time t equals 0. When has the sine function shifted by 2 pi? Well, when I get all the way back again, one full oscillation. In one full oscillation, the sine function goes up, whoops, the sine function goes up, down, and back again to zero. In one full oscillation, so in one full oscillation, the time it takes for one full oscillation is the time that adds 2 pi onto the inside of this sine function. Because every time it does one oscillation, 2 pi more gets added in. If I wanted to plot this as a function of time, I'm going to plot a, uh, what you think of as a sine function right now, starting at 0, at t equals 0. And we'll talk about differences in a second. Um, whoops. So this, so when I had this all the way down at the bottom, where was I? Well, if I, if I had this sine function here, then I could say that where I was was right here. That's actually 3 pi over 2. To, to get down to that spot again, or previously, maybe I started here at minus pi over 2. If I'm down at the bottom at minus pi, at, uh, when the inside of the sine function is minus pi over 2, then by the time I get down to here at 3 pi over 2, I've gone through 2 pi. So that's what I mean when I say the sine function repeats every 2 pi. And that means in terms of time, the time it takes for the complete, one complete sine function, from one spot on the sine function through the whole function back to the same spot again. So I started here at the top, go all the way down to the bottom, come back up to the top, same spot. The time it takes for that is capital T, which is called the period of the oscillation. Capital T is the period, it's the time, it's, period is a period of time. It's the time it takes for one full oscillation. If the time, little t here, goes through an amount equal to capital T, then the capital T's cancel and you just get a 2 pi, and shifting the thing by 2 pi changes it not at all. What's this A out here? Well, Y has units. Y has units of centimeters. How far did I pull it down here? Well, maybe 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters downward, below equilibrium. Oscillates back up to 10 centimeters above equilibrium. So Y is going back and forth between minus 10 centimeters and plus 10 centimeters. What's the sine function doing? What's its limits? Minus 1 and 1. So if y is going to be minus 10 centimeters and plus 10 centimeters and the sine function is minus 1 and 1, then a has to be 10 centimeters. a is, called, is the maximum value of either theta or y. It's called the amplitude. We take A to be a positive number all the time, so we don't switch the, let the number A around. It's just a positive number. It's the amplitude. It tells you how far the object gets from equilibrium at its maximum. You can increase the amplitude. This thing has an amplitude. Its equilibrium point is right around here. 
the angle from equilibrium that it gets to is maybe four or five degrees. If I want to increase the amplitude, I need to add energy. Right now, this system is oscillating back and forth. Kinetic energy goes up when potential energy is going down, and then kinetic energy goes down when potential energy goes up. If I want to add energy, I can make this thing go farther. <coughs> so bigger amplitude ends up being bigger energy. If you work it out, you'll find out that the energy is proportional to the square of the amplitude, not just the amplitude. If you double the, to double the amplitude, you have to add four times as much energy. You probably could have guessed that it was a square if you thought about kinetic energy, because that depends on the square of the velocity. Or if you thought about potential energy, because that depends on the square of the distance away from equilibrium. So both of those depend on squares, and so that's what you would find for the, for the energy is the total energy of the oscillating system depends on the square of the amplitude. The amplitude is the maximum value, so that's A, and this minimum value that is minus A, unfortunately, my minimum value there doesn't seem to make sense with my minimum value here. <coughs> 